Hey everybody and welcome back. We are on, I believe, video number eight, actually. In this video, we're gonna talk about the nitrogen cycle, RODI, salt water, and test kits. Uh, go ahead and like, subscribe, bookmark my website, and click on a link to my website, which is uh, undergoing some changes, but it's slowly building. It's just www.thereeftankblog.com. Check it out. I'm going to be updating it uh, hopefully weekly with some new posts, some educational series, and just some information about my tank that I want to share with you guys. All right, so let's jump right in. Let's talk about the nitrogen cycle. All right, it's uh, obviously something that's talked about a lot and needs to be understood. The nitrogen cycle is the biological process by which organic matter is converted from toxic ammonia to less harmful nitrate gas, basically, okay? Um, so you basically go ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. Uh, and, 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 and how you do this is you really need a healthy community of microorganisms that will consume the various compounds at each step. For example, live rock, live sand bed, bio balls, sponge filters, and other porous media basically help large colonies of bacteria populate. And the bacteria you need are is bacteria for ammonification, nitrification, and denitrification. Basically what happens is anytime you have organic matter, right, whether that's poop, whether that's food, it will uh, start to break down. And when it breaks down, it turns into ammonia. All right? And ammonia is very, very harmful for fish and livestock. So you want to get rid of that really quickly. So what happens is a bunch of bacteria will colonize and uh, they will consume that ammonia and turn it into something less harmful, nitrite. A different kind of bacteria will take that nitrite and turn it into nitrate gas, which will then slowly off gas um, out of your tank. That's, that's basically what you want to do. Um, if you want an in-depth understanding of, of the nitrogen cycle, go ahead and check out my website. A uh, really cool video by Khan Academy. I posted uh, a link to it. I've actually just embedded it right in my site. It's uh, really, really interesting and really, really helpful. There are so many different ways that you can go about cycling a tank, you know, because if you're starting out a brand new tank, um, you know, and there's nothing decaying in your tank, there is nothing to run through the cycle with. So people talk about all sorts of various strategies. One, you can add a couple hardy fish, like clownfish, put them in your tank. They're gonna, you're gonna feed the tank. You're gonna call, they're gonna poop a little bit, and it's gonna start triggering uh, the the uh, nitrogen cycle, right? Because it's gonna break down into ammonia. Then it's gonna have to colonize. But the thing is, is is that can be really harmful for your livestock. You know, it's really stressful to have any ammonia in your tank. So what do some people do? Well, some people will put in just a piece of shrimp. You know, um, it can be really anything. Uh, something that is going to decay in your tank, right? And that will cause the cycle to happen. Um, either way, you can just add some food in there, add some shrimp. But as long as you have adequate live rock, um, if you don't have live rock, you can have some sort of ceramic media plates, bio balls, right? But the more surface area you have, which is the whole point of live rock and a live sand bed, the more uh, beneficial bacteria colonies are going to form so that it can do that conversion process a lot faster. So when you're cycling your tank, basically what you're doing it is you're testing it all the time, right? Um, you're gonna see uh, um, algae start to grow. I mean, you're gonna know that your tank is cycling, you know, cause you're gonna see some phosphate spikes and you're gonna see the algae start to grow. So start testing your tank. Once you see the ammonia levels start to rise, okay, over time that ammonia level should start decreasing, right? And your nitrites and your nitrates should 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 rise instead. Um, and the cycle is complete, I don't know, about 20 days. It's gonna totally vary on the system. So, uh, but you know, around 20 days, it should go ammonia spike down to ammonia back to zero, meaning that things are colonized. One really, really good way of cycling a tank is, um, you know, if you have another tank present or if somebody else has a tank, a buddy has a tank that you know of, you can, you know, put, you know, a sponge in there basically, and that will colonize over time with all that bacteria. And then you can add it in to your tank. There are also products um, like Biospira, Red Sea makes some products uh, that will help cycle your tank quicker. And basically all you're doing is you are helping to colonize the tank with those beneficial bac bacteria. All right, so that's the basic cycle. Go ahead and check out, there's tons of videos online, how I cycled my tank. 
Um, I, you know, had my live rock in there. I put everything set up. You know, I didn't have any livestock in there. Um, and then I just started feeding my tank. Really, I just, I didn't, I literally had nothing in there, but I added food to my tank so that it would slowly decompose, right? Um, and it, it, I mean, it worked. I had a very, very tiny ammonia spike. You could see some algae growth. And then once I went through that kind of mini cycle, I added a couple clowns, right? And those clowns definitely added, you know, more, uh, more organic waste into my system. So then it went through kind of another larger cycle. And kind of every time I've been adding livestock, it's gone through a little bit more of a cycle. Um, but you can see my tank's really healthy and it's worked quite well. All right, when I come back, we are gonna talk about RODI filtration. All right, let's talk RODI filters, all right? Um, a lot of you may know about RO filters, reverse osmosis filters. Those are really good drinking water filters. But when you're talking RODI water, you're adding DI, which is deionization resin. That is these last two canisters over here. Just so you know, don't, don't drink this water. Um, it's probably a little bit too pure and it could actually end up hurting you. There's a debate about that, but I would just not drink RODI water period. Okay, so let's talk about RODI filters. This is kind of the, one of the larger units you're gonna see, a six stage. There's also four stages, right? And, and they're really the same thing. All a six stage is, is it gives it more of the same stuff to go through so that it will filter things out a little bit better. So let's talk about the stages, what happens, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so water enters, you basically connect it using this little guy here. You connect it to your, uh, you, can, you can connect it anywhere, really outside, inside. I connect it to my bathroom sink, right? And then water goes in through here, okay? So it goes in, enters the first stage. The first stage is um, really just there to get large sediments out. So just picture it, it's, it's like your filter floss. It's like your sponge filter, all right? So it's gonna get, you can see it's already getting yellow. Um, something you have to replace quite a bit because if it gets too too full, you know, if it gets too cram packed, um, it's going to slow down your water pressure a lot. All right, water then goes from there. It goes into the carbon blocks. Right, these are just two carbon blocks. Carbon blocks are good at removing chlorine from the water, um, heavy metals, odors, things like that. Um, I'm lucky to live in Seattle where there aren't any chloramines. Right, because these things will reduce chloramines at the very beginning and then they won't. So if you have chloramines in your water system, which a large portion of the United States does, you might want to think about upgrading these carbon filters to ones that are specifically for chloramines, all right? What happens then, the water goes from this last filter stage and it goes up here into your RO, your reverse osmosis membrane, all right? I have two on here and the reason I did that is I upgraded my system this system does about 75 gallons per day if you have the ideal water pressure. This doubles it, right? So I just added two RO membranes. And really all an RO membrane is, is it, 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 it's a rolled up membrane inside there. Um, and it um, lets some water through and rejects a lot of water. So basically it it's in theory only lets pure water through and any sort of dissolved solid that's in the water will be rejected. Right, so what happens if we look over here, okay, um, this has a four to one rejection rate. Now with two of them, it's about two to one. So that means for every one part of water that makes it through, you're gonna have four parts that are going to be um, discarded, right? So what you have is you have this black line. The black line goes down your drain and that's for all of your discarded water. So another good thing about adding a second RO membrane is it cuts down, um, you know, cuts down that water in half. And then the good water basically comes out and it goes over here, all right? And it goes into your DI resin. And this one just has two of them. It's a water, it's a color changing resin so that you know. And the water is already super pure when it leaves here, but the deionization resin cleans it up a little bit more. And then the blue line over here goes um, into your RO bucket. So, you know, I use a 20 gallon trash can that I've already showed you. Some things um, that you want to know about RO filters. Um, there's something called a TDS meter, a total dissolved solid meter. Basically, it measures the hardness of the water. And you want your water, when it's all done, to be as close to zero as humanly possible. Right? So what you can do is you can um, either purchase a TDS meter that's attached as a part of it, or you can just buy a little handheld one. And you can test it at various stages. Right, You could test it. You could test the water that comes out of here. It should have a pretty high TDS. 
you know, obviously test that against your tap water to see what the TDS of your tap water is, right? You can uh, test it um, when it comes out of here as it's heading into your RO, you know, it should have a very, very low TDS. And then you can test it again when it comes out and it should have something close to zero. Your TDS meter really is gonna be the best way to let you know when you need to change your filters, right? So if you're testing the TDS and you're getting, you know, like 10 total, you know, parts per million of total dissolved solids, something's probably wrong. So you can backtrace it and you can test it after your RO membrane. And if you're still getting a somewhat a high TDS meter, it's probably time to replace your filters, right? So pretty simple there. Um, also water pressure is really important. You know, some of us have really good water pressure at home. Some of us don't, you know, and so you can buy a water pressure gauge to see what your water pressure is because you need to have high water pressure somewhere, you know, uh, around 50 PSI, maybe even more than that. If you don't have high water pressure, it's not a big deal. You just buy a booster pump. You attach it onto here and it will increase the water pressure so that this will run efficiently. The RODI system only runs efficiently at a high water pressure. All right, a really good rule of thumb, you know, replace your filters every year. You know, I'm gonna replace my carb, um, my solid uh, sponge block over here, much my sediment filter much more frequently. Um, these I'll replace, you know, the next, and then the um, DI resin is color changing. That I will change when it turns brown. Um, pretty easy to see there. People recommend that whenever you start or stop your filter, you should flush your filter, right? Your um, RO membrane. So what you do is you can just install one of these, and this just changes the flow, right? This is a flow restrictor. And normally you restrict the flow that goes through these, right? But to flush it, you just allow the full water pressure to go through and then no water will make it through your membrane and it will just flush any sort of solid that's on there off. I do it for two minutes before I start filtering and at the very end after I stop filtering. Okay, that's pretty much our ODI filters. When we come back, we're gonna talk about salt water. Salt water. All right, the biggest piece of advice I can give for salt water is there are so many different, well, there's not so many, there's several different brands of salt water you can buy. The best thing you can do is choose one and stick with it. You know, some go for something consistent. And it's really good to know what your goal is first. For example, you can see here, I use Red Sea. Um, and the first one I bought, they're the same price, is I bought this one over here, which is fine, but um, <laughs> I should have bought the Coral Pro first. So I didn't want to waste this, so now I, I mix the two together. And the reason for that being is the Red Sea Salt over here, if you're looking at the calcium magnesium alkalinity, right? Your calcium on the Red Sea Salt, the blue is 410, uh, your magnesium is 1230, and your DKH, your alkalinity is 7.7. .7. Those are all lower than I keep things in my tank which means that every time I do a water change, I'm lowering my calcium, my magnesium, and my alkalinity. Now, that's not terrible because what's happening is I'm also reducing my ammonia, my nitrites, my nitrates, my phosphates, but I'm also adding in um, all the other elements, the essential elements, you know, the iodine, the strontium things. So it's not a terrible thing, but I should have gone with the Coral Pro because it is, has a calcium of 450, magnesium 1340, and DKH above 12, which is definitely much more in line where I want to keep things. So just, just know that going into uh, purchasing your first kind of salt, look at what you want, know what you're, you want your water parameters to be based on if you're going to have, you know, a Fowler tank or, um, you know, a uh, fish only tank or whatever you're going to have. All right. Uh, so yeah, choose a brand, stick with it. You're going to be fine. The thing about it is mix with RODI water. It sounds super obvious, but do not use tap water. Um, some people do use tap water, which is okay, you can do that. Distilled water is a little bit better. Um, you can go to your local fish store and most of the time they will sell you um, RODI water, right? Um, it's really a great purchase to buy an RODI unit. It's gonna save you so much money in the long run um, and you're gonna be able to make it at home. So I highly recommend that. If not, go to your local fish store, buy several gallons at a time, and then mix your own salt water at home. Some of your local fish stores will even have salt water mixed up for you. So that's cool. So mix with um, RODI water, all right? And when you mix it, right, you just put it in your big hefty trash bin like I showed you last video. You know, you wanna add a heater. You wanna heat it to the same temperature um, as your tank is gonna be. 
and you want it to circulate. Uh, you want to keep it oxygenated. So put a little power head in there and keep it going. So when you mix your salt, right, um, you want to mix it up, let it heat up, let it circulate overnight at least. You don't want to add it directly to their, to your tank because you want things to be able to settle. So how do you know how much salt to add? Well, you get one of these handy things called a refractometer, right? This is the, really the best way to do it. A refractometer, what happens here, okay, you use a little dropper. You put drops of the salt water in here. You close it up, and then you look through the end, right? And inside, it's going to show you um, the salinity, right? The salinity varies depending on the temperature, so make sure you let it sit there for, you know, 30 seconds so that it gets to a, up to room temperature, and then you can see what your salinity is. But the thing is, is when you buy a refractometer, you need to calibrate it, right? So you want to buy calibration solution. This one calibrates at 35 um, parts per uh, million. So basically what I do is I drop this onto it and I calibrate it to 35 and I've checked it since. It doesn't lose its calibration. I mean, the calibration is using a screwdriver, so it's you know pretty hard to, to, to change that. So yeah. So that's how you're going to test it. Let it sit overnight. Make sure the temperature is good. Make sure your salinity is right where you want it. Then you're ready to do water changes. I forgot to mention in the RODI section, by the way, you can buy these little um, chlorine test kits. And they're awesome because, let's see here, um, you can tell how much chlorine and also whether or not you have chloramines, right? So you can just purchase one of these little 20 test kits. You know, basically all you do, they're super easy, right? You just take it, you dip it, and then it will change colors, and then you match it up to the colors on the side here. So that's a good way to tell how much chlorines you have, and also a good way to tell when your um, second stage of your RODI units, your carbon blocks, are starting to fail, because we'll be picking up chlorines and chloramines, so then you know it's time to change, to change those. Um, yeah, heat narrate, how to mix. There's really nothing special about mixing your salt water, right? Just um, you know, get your cups, pour it in slowly, stir it up, have a power head going in there, um, let it settle out a little bit, and then stir it up a little bit more. Uh, if you buy a good quality salt mix, it's going to mix really, really well as long as you have it, you know, at a warm temperature. Uh, so yeah, that is basic overview of salt water. Choose a brand, stick with it, heat it, and aerate it, let it sit overnight, and you're good to go. Let's talk essential parameters real quick. This is my terrible handwriting. I'm sorry for everybody. Um, these are going to vary, all right? But this is a pretty good rule of thumb here. Um, if you're going to have a reef tank especially, what you want to keep things. Calcium between 380 and 450. Your DKH or your alkalinity, uh, 7 to 12. Salinity, 32 to 35 parts per million or specific gravity of uh, 1.023, 1.026. Temp, 76 to 82. I keep mine at 78. pH, 7.8 to 8.4. Um, it's okay to have it around 7.8, don't go much lower than that, but the trick is you want to keep it stable, so you don't want it to swing too much. Magnesium, 12 to 1400, I keep mine at the high end. It's rumored that it helps um, keep some sort of algaes at bay, and it also helps to buffer your calcium so you can keep your levels a little bit higher, so I keep mine about 1400. Uh, your phosphate level, PO4, less than 0 0.03. Phosphate not only feeds your algae, but your corals can uptake it into their systems, which can, can retard their growth, can stunt their growth. Um, so you want to keep your phosphate levels low. And then your nitrate, oh sorry, your NH3 is your ammonia, you want it zero, right? As close to zero as you can possibly get it. And all of your other small strontium iodines, essential elements, will be replaced with your water changes. All right, when I come back, we're going to talk about uh, test kits. Test kits have gotten a lot better over the years. Um, again, choose a brand, stick with it. Uh, I use Red Sea. I use Red Sea um, for a few reasons. They have really um, cheap refill kits. Um, but not only that, but uh, they come in these nice, I'll show you here, in these nice plastic. You know, a lot of test kits just come with paper. Sorry, I'm having problems here, and I don't know why. They come with just paper, you know, which is over time is just going to not hold up for you. I cannot, I cannot get this out. There we are. All right, so they come with these really nice plastic test kits so that, you know, things aren't going to get wet. Um, one of the reasons I go with them. Uh, test kits that you need. You know, when you're starting out, you want to test a lot. Once you know your system, you're going to know. 
you know, what's going on without testing as much. Um, but starting on the left, your calcium, magnesium, alkalinity. Obviously, until you get a hang of that, you want to test that as frequently as possible. Um, the middle test kit here, basically I use it for my ammonia, um, ammonia and nitrates. Uh, my pH, I have a pH probe, so I kind of know what that is all the time. And lastly, phosphate on the right hand side. My phosphate always comes up at zero, and the tricky thing about phosphate is um, algae consumes it. So if you see a lot of algae in your tank, you probably have phosphates in there, but your phosphate tests are going to come up zero because it's all being consumed. Um, so I found that my phosphate pro test kit, I've never registered any phosphate. Um, so it's not the most helpful, but I do know there's phosphates in there. Uh, so yeah, your test kits, choose a brand, stick with it, you know. Uh, I do like Red Sea, Salifert makes a good test kit as well. Test it often, you know, test it, you know, up to every day when you're starting out, you know, until you really get a hang of it, until you have the testing memorized so that you can, you know, just sit down and go ahead and test that. Uh, yeah, test kits, so yeah, just choose them. I mean, you you can also test for things like iodine. Um, uh, that's, that's more for advanced reefers, uh, I would say. As long as you're doing your water changes okay, your essential elements, uh, your trace elements are all going to be replaced. So it's not going to be that big of a deal. All right, last thing we're going to discuss is the correlation between pH and CO2. Something that has been such a pain in my butt over the years um, that I didn't fully understand. So, come on back. All right, the relationship between pH and carbon dioxide. I am no expert, but let me just tell you this, right? pH and the level of carbon dioxide in your apartment have a huge inverse relationship to each other. For example, I have a pH probe, so uh, I get real-time updates, right? Whenever my family leaves for the day, pH goes up, goes up 0.15 or so, 0.2 maybe, and then like clockwork, as soon as we get down, as, as soon as we all come home and we start breathing in our apartment again, um, pH tanks, tanks 0 0.15, 0 0.2. Um, I, that took me forever to figure out that our breathing uh, had such a huge impact, right? Um, so things that, that play into that. In the winter time, a lot of us close up our windows. I know we do. Um, I do leave my windows open a little bit now to get some fresh air in because that oxygen uh, is going to increase the pH in your tank and keep things a little bit more stable. Um, some of us uh, have noticed too, uh, at nighttime, your pH goes down, right? Um, it's very, very common. Your corals are releasing their carbon dioxide at nighttime, um, so your pH is gonna decrease. So what a lot of people do is they will dose their alkalinity at nighttime because soda ash um, increases your pH. Uh, they will also add a refugium, you know, and they will light the refugium on an opposite cycle. So. When the lights go off in the tank, they will turn the lights on in the refugium, which should help stabilize your pH. Another thing you can do to stabilize your pH is you can put an air line, an air intake, um, into your protein skimmer and basically draw fresh air from outside so you're always infusing fresh, fresh oxygen. Um, you can also put some fans over your tank to help keep uh, fresh air moving in and around your tank. You really just have to play with it for quite a while. Eventually, you'll get the hang of it. You'll figure out what you need to do. Just try to keep things stable. You know, if your pH, if you really want, you know, to get your pH up to 8.3, but you live in a cold place and you keep your windows closed, it's probably not going to happen. And that's not a big deal. You know, if you have pH around 7.9 and it's consistently there, it's going to be fine, right? Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's nothing to stress about. You could also try caulkwasser, right? If you add caulkwasser, um, lime water into your auto top off, uh, that's going to also keep your pH up. Um, so that's another trick you can do. But just, just try to keep things stable. That's all I can say. Anyway, thank you guys for checking out these videos. I think there's only a couple left in this series. Go ahead and check out my website, www.thereeftankblog.com. Ask any questions. And again, thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye.